Funding for this program has been provided by the annual financial support of viewers like you and by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Information Superhighway of the 70s, the first ever computer network, was a tool built mainly by graduates of MIT for universities. But linking mainframes on campuses had no commercial application. It took the invention of the personal computer to transform it and spread networking from campus to offices and beyond. Personal computers proliferating on company desktops, it was a logical next step to connect them all into a network. Logical, maybe, but first someone had to figure out how to do it. And the guy who did was Bob Metcalf. <coughs> Apparently their sleep is deep. It's not working today. They're old and rare, and they're um, Gloucestershire old spot pigs. They're the sort of pig's pig, the classic pig. Uh, they're not commercially viable. Here you go, Bob. Fortunately, I'm not at all pig averse. Well, reassure. Yeah, you're very sweet. Bob Metcalf owns a farm in Maine, but we wouldn't call him a farmer. This farm exists to preserve genetic diversity, not to make a living. Bob doesn't need to work. His claim to fame is to be the first computer networking millionaire. How did he do it? It helps to have uh, good parents, and then it helps to uh, work really hard for a long period of time and go to school forever, and then it works to drop quite by accident into the middle of Silicon Valley where you're swept up into an inexorable process of entrepreneurship and wealth generation, and you pop out the other side with a farm in Maine. I hate to oversimplify. Bob Metcalf started his computer science career as a summer alternative to working at the beach club. I took computer programming courses because my fraternity brothers told me that if I took 6251, which was systems programming, that I could get a job in the summer for appreciably more than I would, uh, was then getting during the summers as a cabana boy. They have a waiting list because these are really scrumptious, scrumptious lamb chops. He helped build the original ARPA network as a graduate student. And I was at Harvard, miserable and unhappy, looking for research. And I ran across ARPA opportunities to work on the ARPANET. He landed a research job in Silicon Valley, but Bob went from Boston to California via Hawaii. Bob had just finished his PhD. He had uh, taken a job at Xerox Park, and Bob is a consummate salesman. Uh, imagine this, if you had just gone into a new job, before you showed up for work, you'd get your boss to send you to Hawaii for three months. Uh, Bob did that. Bob's career in networking really took off when he got hired here. In the history of PCs, this is the place, the whole enchilada. It's Jerusalem, Rome, and Mecca all rolled into one. Think of anything about PCs. One processor per user, graphical user interfaces, laser printers. It was invented right here at Xerox Park. And that includes a method of linking desktop computers together so that nerds could share work, software, spreadsheets, printers, and my sister's phone number. 
Push another button, and the information is sent electronically. The folks at Xerox Park in the mid 1970s were living in the future. Long before the IBM PC or the Macintosh, at Xerox they invented a personal computer called the Alto, and there was one on every researcher's desk. We knew, we knew as a fact what the world was going to look like 10 years because we had already built it and we saw that it worked. So we knew what to do. Uh, first you do this, then you do this, because we did it already. Using technical ideas from both ARPANET and ALOHANET, Bob Metcalf invented a way of linking Park's Altos together. People don't get how revolutionary that was, but it was our research goal to put a computer on every desk, not let alone every building. So we needed a network that would connect um, hundreds of computers at hundreds of kilobits per second at hundreds of meters of separation. That was our spec. And out popped a network for doing that at three megabits per second uh, among up to 256 computers separated by up to a mile along one big piece of coaxial cable, which we called the ether. Larry Tesler remembers Bob's breakthrough, a technical triumph of bigger bits and smarter packets. It came up a little bit at a time. First they were able to just send a, uh, a few signals back and forth, and then a few bytes back and forth, and entire packets, and then they were able to do entire streams of packets. And after a while, it really worked, and they created a lot of Ethernet boards, and everybody in Park who had an Alto got a board, and we could start using the Ethernet. It was a pretty exciting time. We built computers to sit on everyone's desk and then watched what happened. And so we worked in an economics-free zone, which is a way that research is often conducted, and uh, produced this network of PCs, an internet of PCs. We built our own internet. Call it a paper explosion, or data overload, or asset mismanagement. What's needed is not a new system, but a new concept. This is the Ethernet cable, a passive carrier capable of accepting transmissions from various kinds of office machines and terminals. And With the invention of Ethernet, PC networking became a practical possibility. For the PC pioneers, this was the realization of a dream. Well, the whole vision of why personal computers would be a great thing on every desktop and in every home had to do with using them as a communications tool, had, to, had them connected together. People thought, you, so you suddenly had a device that you really wanted to plug into a network. So they would all work in concert, or at least could exchange messages and share files, and that kind of thing. Uh, so the PC really wa gave birth to the networking age. We suddenly had something that we wanted to network. It's right here, see it? Okay. A technologist. He's also an Stop. entrepreneur. When Xerox didn't exploit Ethernet widely, Bob thought he could. So he opened up the directory of Western venture capitalists. Starting in November 78, I started going through that directory, having breakfast, lunch, and dinner with everybody I could find on that in that directory. Not to raise money, I just asked them how to start a company. In June of 79, I sat down to name my company and ended up calling it Computer communication name and a check from his backers, Bob's new company set about building Ethernet cards, just as the PC boom began. Great timing and very it. profitable. Yeah. Amazing. Congratulations, you're now a member of the Maze Club. Thank you. One card for a thousand dollars. They now go in quantity for nineteen dollars each, but a thousand dollars could put your PC on the Ethernet. Of course, we had to build a network operating system to make it useful, which we did. And we shipped all that in September of 82. And uh, people started buying it. And by 1983, we were growing 50 to 80 percent per quarter sequentially. And by March of 84, we were public with about 12 million in revenue. And by the time I left in 1990, we were 400 million, $400 million a year with 2,000 people. And now, in 1997, three incredible. This Xerox sales pitch exaggerated Ethernet's range. It was a thousand feet, but Ethernet still vastly transformed the usefulness of PCs. The challenge now was to design a commercial computer specifically to exploit the advantages of a network. It wasn't long in coming. Is it a PC? Is it a mini computer? No, it's a workstation. 
What's the difference? Well, unlike those first two, this machine can't do any work by itself. It has to be part of a network. This is the original Sun workstation from 1982, quite a landmark in the history of the Internet. The young people who designed it coined the term, the network is the computer. So with this workstation, I can access information on other computers on the network. I can store my information on other computers on the network, and I can harness the power of every computer on the network. Those folks at Sun, they're very bright. The Sun workstation has become an $8 billion business. When the PC was little more than a high-powered typewriter, workstations had the processing power to meet the needs of Wall Street, NASA, and even Hollywood. Guess where it started? This is Margaret Jacks Hall at Stanford University, one of the most historic buildings of the digital age. Three companies got their start here. Cisco Systems in the basement, Silicon Graphics on the second floor, and Sun Microsystems on the fourth. Collectively, they must have a market value of, oh, $100 billion. And Stanford University never made a penny from any of them. What are they doing to this place? Uh, the first Sun workstation was built in an office on this floor by a young German graduate student named Andy Bechtelsheim, who just couldn't wait to get out of the fatherland. I was actually quite frustrated with the, the German university program at the time because I, I truly felt I was wasting my time. You know? So the, the first thing I went when I went to a German university in, in the middle, middle 70s was I applied to come here. It's like, <laughs> it was very boring. I mean, it, it was simple things like, you know, we, we had to sign up for terminals to use a computer and you can only get one hour of terminal time per week. You know, I mean, how, how can you even learn programming in this way? A clever geek like Andy is essential to any digital startup, but in order to succeed, you also need someone with a driving ambition to get things done. For Sun, that spark came from a Stanford graduate from India, Vinod Koshla. Ever since I was 16, going to high school in India, I dreamed of coming to Silicon Valley to start a company. I was a technology geek. Um, and it was a very much a dream of mine to start a company. In fact, in 76, when I graduated from engineering school in India, I tried to start a technology company in India. Short of funds, he used standard parts like the Motorola processor and Ethernet and licensed his design to anyone who'd pay. We had this crazy idea that if we build a 30-bit microcomputer with a, a big screen display and an Ethernet connection running the, the Unix operating system, we would have the perfect product for the, you know, the researchers and the scientists and the students at Stanford. Andy was developing the Sun technology at Stanford. He had complete rights to it. He was in the middle of finishing his PhD. When I first approached him, he said he didn't want to start a company, but he would license all of the Sun technology to me for $10,000. And I said, I don't want to do that. He said he didn't want to quit his PhD. And he said he had already licensed it to about five other players. And I said, I want the goose that lays the golden egg. I don't want the golden egg. Vinod made Andy an offer he couldn't refuse, half his share in the embryonic company. Vinod got his goose. And with an Indian and a German on board, how about an American? Scott McNeely, Vinod's best friend. Now it was time to divvy up the jobs. There were two MBAs, Vinod Kosla and myself. He had done a startup before, so when he, we sat around and he said, what job do you want? And I go, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know anything about this stuff. And he goes, well, why don't you be CEO? And I said, no, no, I don't know anything about it. You be. So we had an argument, and he finally agreed to be CEO. They went for the best, a legendary programmer at Berkeley named Bill Joy, who had already delighted his university by creating for them their very own version of the Unix computer operating system. Uh, they, they showed up at my office at Berkeley, and I thought these were like the engineers and not the... I didn't realize these were the principals. You know, they looked so young and so innocent that I just I, I sat them in my corner of my office and made them wait till the rest of the people showed up. And then we had uh, uh, Bill, Joy, and Andy. The first time they met, they did a Vulcan mind meld. They were just kind of like holding each other's forehead. And you couldn't get too near them because the sparks and the smoke and the flame. And at Berkeley, Bill would simply take the system, the Unix system, and rewrite it over the weekend. No, no human on the planet could do this except for Bill. And you'd come in in the following week and say, what has Bill changed now? And every once in a while, he'd decide to do a new release, and he'd do a release every three months. And he would personally read and write 
would rewrite all of the code in the system, including all of the applications. Inconceivable today and amazing at the time. So far, this was a startup from a textbook. But for this quartet from America's melting pot, there was still one final hurdle to be crossed, getting funding for their idea. Often, this is a nightmare. But for these sun seekers, this American dream was, well, a no-brainer. We wrote a five-page business plan. Uh, a week or two later, we showed it to some venture people. They said, oh, this is great. You know, here's a check for you. Basically, we shot them the, the plan on Thursday, Friday. On Tuesday, we had a check in the hand, and we started the company. It was four of us sitting in a little basic, uh, basically rent-by-the-hour office space in Santa Clara. I had mine. We were all 27. And then we got our first load of furniture and got asset tag numbers and tagged one of the chairs asset number one and had employee number one with all the intellectual property in, with the cardboard box sit in asset number one and took a picture. The Sun workstation was designed from the start to be part of a network. The whole concept of the network is the computer. We started uh, the Sun 15 years ago based on the fact that every computer should be hooked to every other computing device uh, on the planet. And uh, that's been our strategy and our goal from uh, day one. Computers become much more useful once they're connected because it's the, the sum of the computers on the network that allow you to, to do more than you could do in any individual computer. Because Andy had used off-the-shelf software and hardware for his workstation, Sun made a virtue of necessity and based all their products on these open standards. It made them different from companies like Microsoft and Apple, and they've been the champions of open standards ever since. We added openness. In other words, nobody should own the written and spoken language of computing in the same way that nobody owns English, French, or German. Now, Microsoft might disagree and think that maybe they ought to own the written and spoken right to use license to speak English or Windows or whatever they happen to own. On the Stanford campus, computer scientists are known to be nimble both at juggling and business opportunities. Most networking advances come from graduates in university labs, yet it's the geeks smart enough to exploit their work who have reaped the financial rewards. Sun may stand for Stanford University Network, but Stanford didn't cash in. Stanford never want, owned a piece of Sun. They did not want any piece of it. Um, I bet they, they lived to regret that. They lived to regret that. In fact, the funny story goes, uh, Prime and DEC both looked at the technology, evaluated it, and said they didn't want it. On that basis, I think Stanford decided that it wasn't of much value, and they let Andy own it. Stanford actually had a very, in fact, Berkeley had very enlightened, and still do, very enlightened uh, technology perspectives. And that is, the student developed that they could take the intellectual property and, and go out. So Andy, when he created the Stanford University Network, under government grants, as well as help from Stanford, he was allowed to walk out with the intellectual property, or the IP, and uh, start a company with that. <laughs> Sun's timing was perfect. They caught the wave of networked computers and offered a low-cost solution for another need. This was the 80s, and Wall Street was crunching numbers faster than ever for junk bond issues, arbitrage deals, and other kinds of financial smoke and mirrors. Sun workstations filled the trading rooms of banks, brokerages, and minimum security prisons. The thing about Wall Street is it's extremely competitive. In other words, if somebody can, can compute something or figure something out faster than the guy next door, it doesn't matter what the equipment costs, they're trading. And uh, Sun eventually became you know, the dominant standard on Wall Street for trading workstations, uh, not just on Wall Street, actually worldwide. It wouldn't be the last time that Stanford would watch a hugely profitable company ride off the campus. Utah, journey's end for the early Mormon wagon trains and home to their church. An unlikely place on the face of it for the next development in networking. Perhaps not when you consider the virtues of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Hard work, commitment, the will to overcome great odds to reach the promised land. And of course, great singing voices.
The networking breakthrough occurred at a most unlikely place, a computer systems company in deep financial trouble. Here's just the faintest reminder that this was the first home of Novell Data Systems, now Novell. It was a startup that failed. Lots of startups fail. Some fail and die. Others fail and are refocused and reborn. That's what happened with Novell. The company was really in trouble. They were shopping around for new venture capitalists. They'd run out of money. And actually, at the 11th hour, uh, the week before Ray Norda came on, they were at, we actually had a little uh, auction at the company. We were selling desks and chairs and equipment so we could make the payroll the next week. Oh, wow. And uh, Ray Norda literally came at the 11th hour and uh, uh, rescued us. It wasn't the U.S. Cavalry, but the next best thing. Ray Norda was a veteran turnaround wizard, venture capitalist, and Mormon. Some say the company. The treasure Ray Norda found in the ruins of Novell was a software project called Netware started only a month before. Netware allowed users to store their data files on big PCs called servers, to share their data with other users, and to use any printer on the network. PCs just couldn't do this stuff before. And the guy who thought it all up, Drew Major, wasn't even a Novell employee. But that Ray, he knew a winner when he saw one. Mountain biking in the Wasatch Range. I quickly discovered that my brain functions better at sea level. But despite the thin air, Novell prospered. Ray came in, investors brought him in and said, can you fix this? Can you, can you turn some money? And he said, you know, the future is software. It's software that connects these computers together and got us out of hardware. And later got us completely out of hardware, which was at one time, hardware was 60% of Novell's business. So to, to get out of that was a big move, but it paid off in spades. We caught this vision. We knew that the industry was going to need file servers and they're going to need to share data. And though the company was falling apart, we, we just kept cranking on it because we knew that, for example, if the company would have went bankrupt, we were contractors. They didn't even have us under a contract. We would have had uh, at least some some rights to what we had developed, and so so that kept us going. And of course, the vision, even though the company itself, business-wise, was in real trouble. And, and Ray saw that enthusiasm. I think he got a glimpse of how big it was. I think in the high-tech area, you, you know, you could you could say it was technology. We were fast. You could say it was people. Drew is really smart. Uh, he is a brilliant man. Uh, Ray was strategic in what he did, but it has a lot to do with timing. The, the advent of the PC, the market need, Novell filled it. In December, we went and saw an IBM PC, the first one in Utah. IBM did a lot of stuff right, and so we thought, well, hey, we could network, network that. And so uh, we bought the first IBM PC in Utah. We were the first guys to network the IBM PC. We've got three calls holding in network client utilities, 22 minutes being the longest wait time. Four calls strong. This is Novell's very own customer radio station. It's here to keep NetWare users amused while they're on hold. When you have millions of customers, this is the price of success. Here we go into the next set. Norda's business savvy and major software skills created a global market and turned Novell around. Quite frankly, the thing that's amazed me the most is other people for, for a number of years didn't get it. They were focusing on other things, the sexy things. This was kind of plumbing, you know, who wants to write a file server, file systems? You know, that's, that's old stuff. That's not, but it was very strategic and very fundamentally valuable for us. They had figured out the most cost-effective way to link a bunch of personal computers together. They had taken a, a very small part of the problem. They decided we're going to let you, you know, share files off disks. Uh, we're going to let you attach all these computers together in a network and we're going to let you share files and we're going to let you share printers and maybe send email back and forth and that's pretty much it and uh, virtually everyone wanted to do that with their PC network and they came to utterly dominate the, P you know, the PC network world and that red box at their height was as common as any logo I can think of. It was the equal, certainly the equal of Microsoft uh, in those days. If you needed a PC network, if you, you know, and the IBM PC and the Intel-based PCs were just growing by leaps and bounds, and we connected them together better than anybody. So ours was the 
LAN OPERATING SYSTEM OF EVERYBODY. But, THE uh, REWARDS FOR SUCCESS IN UTAH ARE NOT SO DIFFERENT FROM SILICON VALLEY. WELL, MAIBE YOU WOUDN'T HAVE A TROUT STREAM AT THE BOTTOM OF YOUR PALO ALTO GARDEN. CERTAINLY THE GUYS AT NOVELL HAVE DONE NICELY. DAVID BRADFORD IS THEIR GENERAL COUNSEL. HE CATCHES THE FISH HERE SO OFTEN HE KNOWS THEM BY NAME. Beaver maybe coming up the other side. Oh yeah. So I'm gonna time you. How long will it take to catch a fish? Uh, it could be two casts, but I would guarantee a fish within 50 casts. And that's a good cast. There. Oh boy, look at that. Okay. We got. Okay. Oh. oh. Did you see that? We lost him, but he was a nice one. In the 80s. No one could catch Novell. I know what you're wondering. Here we are, halfway through the story. We've had everything from prize pigs to Mormons, and still no sign of Microsoft. How can that be? What's Bill Gates doing? An archive footage. The 80s were good to Microsoft. Thanks to their partnership with IBM, the money rolled in, and the company got bigger and bigger. But it was a love-hate relationship. They loved the royalties from selling all that software for IBM PCs and clones. But Bill Gates hated having to fit Microsoft's plans into IBM's business strategy. One thing that's hard to remember now is that all of us uh, were in fear of IBM because IBM wasn't just... Buying most of the operating systems in the world's personal computers might be enough for some people, but Bill's always hungry for the next opportunity. In the computer market, when the first person comes along and does something very well, if they get over a certain threshold, then uh, it really develops momentum because the distribution channel doesn't want a customer base. They start talking to you about, why don't you fix this? Why don't you improve that? And we've seen many, many products like that in the history of personal computing, some Microsoft products, some non-Microsoft products. Network is a great example of that. Whenever someone builds a big business, uh, some people say that this is a bad thing, some people say it's a good thing, but it's clearly a thing. Uh, Bill looks at how does that business relate to the businesses we're in, and if that's a good business on a standalone basis, let's get into it. And certainly if it's a good business that's adjacent to or related to our businesses, we better get into it. In the 80s, there was a very good adjacent business that Microsoft didn't dominate. Networking. Novell. It was stomping all over the competition. Novell grew up with a gun to its head. Remember when, when, when Novell started, there was two companies. I'll remind you, they were Microsoft and IBM. Novell was an accident in their minds, as should not have been. And, you know, I, I guess we challenged that. And we're an underdog. We, we had nothing to lose and everything to gain. One thing about Microsoft is, you know, we're very competitive. And, and if we don't start seeing results, I mean, you know, it, you know, Bill makes life tough on everyone. And, um, I mean, I kind of felt bad for the networking guys because, you know, we continued to struggle. And around 83 and 84, and certainly around by 85, network was reaching critical mass. Uh, and uh, so Microsoft felt really uh, like there was a huge missed opportunity. In fact, I remember some memos Bill wrote in circa 85, 86, where he said, you know, one of the biggest disasters for the company uh, is that... Uh, uh, is that we have no assets in networking or very weak assets in networking. Live from Salt Lake City, it's Brain Share Tuesday morning with Bob and Tina. And now here's Bob and here's Tina. She the sponsor activities last night. Novell had great assets in networking. They even had network conventions and zany network infomercials. While IBM wasn't interested in networking PCs, Microsoft was. So Bill cast his eyes to Utah. Well, Gates was very focused on Novell. It was the first time he contacted us late 1989 to see if he wanted, uh, see if Novell was interested in being bought. Really? So that started two episodes of Microsoft trying to buy Novell. We all thought, hey, maybe if we band together, uh, we'll be able to compete and get you know some portion of the market in a world that that IBM dominates. And and so that was a motivating factor, both of the times that we uh, sat down and talked. The thing that makes it tough, though, is you get two different development sites, and if you have this vision of an operating system, a single operating system that's going to do everything, having those multiple sites and those different visions is tough. 
But I have to say, it's, it's surprising that we never got together. There's a traditional Microsoft tactic. If you can't join them, beat them. Microsoft looked for a partner to line up against Novell. At the time, I mean, we thought that, well, you know, wouldn't it be great to align ourselves with someone else? And, and we thought that the, that the best partner to compete against uh, Novell, um, you know, would have been 3Com. And so we actually entered into a kind of a strategic uh, relationship with 3Com that ultimately, uh, you know, didn't turn out very well. But, uh, but nevertheless, it, it actually got us... In our frustration with Novell, we threw in, we 3Com threw in with Microsoft to unseat Novell in the networking software business. You know, we both went into it with a, a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of energy. I think we wound up having a business relationship that was cumbersome at best, a technical relationship that was a little bit difficult. And that enterprise met a horrible end uh, in the late 80s. A horrible Ultimate, end. A horrible end, ultimately leading. The cause of Bob's horrible end is still a matter of dispute. But everyone now agrees that Microsoft and IBM had a falling out, and then so did Microsoft and 3Com. What Microsoft failed to tell us was that their relationship with IBM was falling apart at that moment, uh, which came as a big surprise about three days after we signed the deal. We eventually separated. I think there was good intent on both companies' part. I frankly, to this day, think we managed the thing very professionally. I know Metcalf has has, you know, some bitterness about it, but we were both properly looking after our business interests and properly both companies trying to be good partners. And then in 1989, uh, Microsoft announced OS2 Land Manager. And I can remember reading the headlines, OS2 Land Manager going to put the network operating system out of business. And they predicted by 1991, Microsoft would have 60% share of the network operating system market with OS2 Land Manager and said that Novell's share of the same market would drop to 25% by 1991. Well, by 1991, our share of 50% that we had in 1989 had grown to 75%, and they still hadn't made a dent. So, When that product failed to take off to Microsoft's satisfaction, the middle-level managers at the company there had to blame someone. They blamed us. And so Microsoft double-crossed 3Com and went around us to our own customers with our own product. And uh, so 3Com went into a loss situation just long enough for the board of directors of 3Com to decide they needed a new change, a new management. I don't think he has a reason to be as bitter as, as, as he is. No, I mean, we were two companies, two grown companies, with grown people are operating the companies, and we attempted to do a business deal of it uh, with their products, and uh, um, they weren't able to do that, and I think that he felt that we sort of unfairly got them into the contractual situa situation, um, but, you know, it takes two people to sign a contract. When I complained to Microsoft about this, I said, why is it doing this? And the guy involved, who I will not name, but the guy involved looked me straight in the eye and said, you made a mistake. You trusted us. <laughs> Far from the high-stakes rivalries of networking market share, the grassroots of the Internet were steadily growing and in unconventional directions. More users were tuning in and turning on, attracted by the chance to connect with like-minded people, even dead people. No one should underestimate the influence on the development of the Internet of the Grateful Dead. So I've got my T-shirt, my VW Microbus, and I'm headed out now to see a guy who knows exactly what a long, strange trip it's been to the wired world. You are listening to Dead to the World on KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. My name is David Gans. There are a million ways to appreciate the Grateful Dead, and we found a lot of ways to talk about them. Space. Deadheads could now meet in an online virtual community called the Well, or Whole Earth Electronic Link. Even a virtual community needs a real computer. The Wells server was based in Sausalito, California. Some entities like the Deadheads, the people that were basically following the Grateful Dead, who are not a regional phenomenon at all. 
and wh where they became regional was on the well. That was their neighborhood. On March 1st, 1986, the Grateful Dead Conference opened its doors, and various people from the net came over and got accounts, and even more interestingly, various people went out and bought computers so they could get online and start talking with us. We're credited with generating sufficient cash flow to keep the well going through its early startup days. It was, it was great to see it. It was really, really fun because we were people who had a lot to talk about. Well, I know what its impact was on the, on the well, which was it probably saved our butt. How? Oh. Well, it just gave us a commercial scale of absolutely dedicated customers all in uh, you know, a couple of months. One fell swoop, suddenly here's a bunch of people who want to talk to each other all the time. Then tape trading. I would imagine that tape trading is responsible for, oh, 18% of the entire packet traffic on the Internet right now. <laughs> I made that up, Bob. <laughs> but it's huge. There's a book called The Great Good Place that came along about halfway along in the starting of the well, which is about great pubs and barber shops and beauty shops and coffee shops where people go and they just hang out and it's not work and it's not their house, it's this other third place that they go to just hang. The well became a great good place. Fringely's fourth law of commerce states, new media create new opportunities. But what kind of profit could anyone turn on the strictly non-commercial internet? John McAfee was the first person to answer that question. He gave away his antivirus software and made a fortune. Nice life. The unique thing about software, which I had, I had thought about you know, ever since the, uh, the mid-70s, is that Software production is unlike ev any other raw materials are required. No time is required and no effort is required. You can make a million copies of a piece of software instantaneously for free. And there's something unique about that. And I, I've, I, I kept you know, running it around in my mind thinking, oh, what can you do with this? What? It's, it's so unique. It's so unusual. Nothing like it has ever appeared in the world before. And finally it came to me, aha, a new business paradigm. You just give it away because it doesn't cost anything. You simply charge for the update process. You get the copy free. You can use it as long as you want. If you want the updates, we'd be happy to give them to you for a nominal fee. And after we had five or 10 million copies out there, it was a very simple process to turn the switch and begin charging for updates. It's time to explain another key figure in our story, the venture capitalist. Without the VC, few new technologies would be built. Fewer geeks would attain fabulous wealth. Perhaps even the information revolution itself would never have happened. This is a VC watering hole near Palo Alto. In the 1980s, networking companies became a third industry segment alongside PCs and software. More companies meant more venture capitalists and more power breakfasts. This is Buck's Restaurant in Woodside, where the VCs meet to figure out how many millions they'll give for what percentage of each startup. They ought to call it Mega Bucks. It must be a great place for tips. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. Are the tips good here? They're excellent. Venture capitalists. You love them or you loathe them. But if you need money for your pet idea, you can't ignore them. These digital temples, monuments to the success of information technology, all needed venture capital to leave their garages behind. For all of them, it began with the occasion which strikes fear into the heart of every Silicon Valley entrepreneur. This is the mating dance of Silicon Valley. Entrepreneurs with business plans perform for venture capitalists with bags of money to invest. Each needs the other, yet it's the VCs who decide whether or not to mate. They call this dance the pitch, and it can mean the difference between failure and a billion dollar IPO. Some entrepreneurs do this dance a hundred times and never raise anything. Mike and I left because what we wanted to do was to bring um, electronic communication of information to the world. We are the outsourced messaging service for the Internet. Despite cautionary tales and horror stories that could outdo both Grimm and Aesop, this is a scene which is played out thousands of times a year in front of venture capitalists. It seems like you co-found a bunch of great things and then you bail out. Is it just that you... Well, I don't think, you ten, get tired years, I don't think ten years is bailing out. <laughs>
It's horribly repetitive for everyone. Nine out of ten pitches fail. But just occasionally, a venture deal presents itself which looks like a sure thing. For example, McAfee Associates in 1990. Employees and a run rate of a burn rate of $300,000 a year. So we didn't need money. We needed advice. And so we took on the two venture partners, and it certainly is the best deal they'd ever done. And, and for me, I, I didn't get hurt either. They turned it into a real company. It just strikes me as a kind of layperson here that $15 million in the bank is a real business. Well, it, it, it isn't, isn't it? Depends on, it, it's, you know, it, it depends on how you want to measure yourself. Yeah, yeah. They invested uh, $10 million, and I believe from my last conversations with TA and Summit that it was the largest deal in terms of net results that they have, they have ever done. Each of them netted over $100 million on this. So they, they each put in $5 million bucks and, and each got $100 million out. You know, as much of a bad reputation as VCs have, they are in fact sharks, uh, there's no question. But once they're on your side, they're your think sharks. about it, they're your sharks. <laughs> um, and, and it's like, wow, you know, so, you know, you, if, if you struggle with them and if you can come out, you know, bleeding as little as possible and survive, then you're, you're, in, you're in Fat City. John McAfee pulled off the final coup in startup business, the exit strategy of selling his company for a couple of hundred million dollars. Now there has to be a way for a geek like me to get access to venture capital. Back in Silicon Valley, there's naturally a very Californian way of conducting business. Here instead of three martini luncheons, these VCs play ultimate frisbee. That's co-ed American football with a frisbee instead of a ball. But forget about the rules. I've come up with a great cringely get-rich-quick scheme. i got to get some money. I'm going to network with these guys. Can you take Tracy? And I'll take the I don't know who Tracy is. She's the only girl over Oh! There. Never underestimate. I know. So stay on her. She's good. She's fast. As I set out to test my ultimate Frisbee skills, I also had ringing in my ears the wise advice of one of the Valley's most renowned venture capitalists, John Doerr. Caesar said all of Gaul is divided into three parts. Well, all of risk is divided into four parts. There are really four risks you've got to look for in every project. The first is people risk. That is, how the team is going to work together. Because invariably, one of the founders doesn't work out and falls out, which is why you want their options or equity to vest. The second risk is market risk, and that's incredibly expensive risk to remove. That's about whether or not the dogs are going to eat the dog food. Is there a market for this product? And by the time you get the product to market, you may have expenses of a million dollars a month. You don't want to be wrong about market risk. I get no. I get real. The third risk that we're quite willing to take on is a technical risk. That's about whether or not we can make a pen computer that works, or be the first to commercialize a web browser, or to uh, split the atom, if you will. That technical risk is one we're comfortable uh, trying to eliminate and take on. The fourth and final risk is financial risk. If you have all of the preceding three right, can you then get to the capital that you need to go grow the business. And uh, uh, typically you can. There's plenty of capital to finance uh, rapidly growing new technologies that are addressing uh, uh, large markets. Sorry, Bob, your idea sucks. We're not funding it. <laughs> There's this myth that Silicon Valley companies are always started in garages, but there are other options. The biggest company in the networking business, for example, was started in a living room in this house where Len Bozak and Sandy Lerner used to live. They were Stanford academics, but they were in different departments on different computer networks and unable to send email messages like, did you feed the cat? So they invented a way of networking networks with things called routers. The company they started in 1983, Cisco Systems, today does $10 billion a year in business. Routers created great wealth for the Cisco founders, Sandy Lerner and her former husband, Len Bozak. Their story is a classic nerd saga that started by accident and ended in a boardroom drama that many company founders have experienced to their cost. Was it your, your love of computers and networking that drew you two together? 
Or he had great legs or what? You know, I'll just have to tell you something that's so bizarre, you'll just have to assume that it's true. Len's mother had done this miraculous job and Len actually knew how to bathe and eat with silverware and I was absolutely enchanted. You know, he used to take whisk and like wash his collars and cuffs, which was way more than I ever did. And I just, I just didn't think that a more perfect man could exist. Let's meet Len Bozak and find out about his work ethic. Sincerity begins uh, at a little over 100 hours a week. You can probably get to 110 on a sustained basis, but it's hard. You have to get down to eating once a day and showering every other day, things of that sort, to, to really get uh, your life organized to work 110 hours a week. And the, and, and the level that follows sincerity, uh, what do we call that? Commitment. Len was a brilliant network technologist. Here he is, hard at work, in a snapshot from Sandy's Cisco Scrapbook. It was do-it-yourself networking. If you wanted it, you had better do it yourself because no one else was going to do it for you. You couldn't buy it. We basically pulled wire through manholes. We pulled wire through disused sewer pipe. Um, we built a lot of things by ourselves. I mean, it was very, very much, a, at that point, a, a guerrilla action. We had no money, and we certainly didn't have any official sanction. Um, in the end, I guess the university was kind of allowed not to like it, but they did get a network out of it. The Stanford campus was 16 square miles. In 1984, its 5,000 computers were grouped in their own networks in separate buildings. Like islands, they needed causeways or bridges to connect them into a campus-wide network. We first built some bridges, and then we built some crude routers, and then we built better routers. and That solved, for Stanford, the same sort of problem that it solved uh, 10 years earlier for ARPA, of how to use a computer anywhere you want it. On the digital highway, packets are blasting this way and that, going from network to network on the way to their ultimate destinations. At every point where one network is linked to another, there's a box called a router. Think of a router as a traffic cop. Like the cop, a router does three things. It stops traffic, it starts traffic, and it gives directions. So routers keep local packets from leaving their own network and clogging the internet. Internet packets they let go through and even give them directions to the next router. What routers don't do is eat donuts or give tickets. Once Len and Sandy had solved Stanford's networking problem, they saw an opportunity to offer the solution to other users. But Stanford didn't want to do it. And so we kind of really tried to get them to license the technology to these other universities, and they just we're not going to do it. Um, and so with tears in our eyes, we took our $5 up to the you know, Secretary of State's office in San Francisco and made Cisco Systems and took it anyway. So how did you go about it? Well, in the same tradition that uh, anyone else in the Gulch does, uh, you go out and buy a bunch of parts and try and make the stuff and uh, then go sell it and uh, solve the problems that come up. That are built out of Len and Sandy's dedication wasn't in question. So this archival gem from 1989 may be a little low on production values, but it shows just how single-minded these two were. In part, the result of some fairly unsophisticated. Shut it off. Well, that's very interesting. That wasn't the Wellfleet Marketing Department bombing. The Cisco premises. That was a genuine San Francisco earthquake. Looks like not even an earthquake could divert their attention from the glorious business of routers and bridges. So the Cisco headquarters was their house. The technology was well borrowed from Stanford, and their operating budget was plastic. You sort of uh, spend against your credit cards and hope that the checks come in from your customers fast enough to uh, meet your uh, expenditures. How did you decide? How much to charge for your, for your products? We guessed. Now, how big a business could you build on your credit cards? About a half a million dollars a month. Well, one bedroom was uh, the lab. Uh, another bedroom was uh, office space. And when it was time to build and test something, well, that was the living room. We financed the company on credit cards. We were turned down by 70 or 80 venture capitalists. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty touch and go. 
There's a downside to VC involvement. For all that money, they expect to own most of the company, to sit on the board, to tell you whom to hire, to generally question the competence of the founder to run the company. It can end in tears. Don Valentine was venture capitalist number 77, and his previous investments show that he understood the potential of this business. We knew from the experiences at Apple and at 3Com that the world was going to be connected. At that point, I think we were, Cisco was doing, I think, a quarter million, maybe, maybe 350,000 a month uh, without a professional sales staff and without an uh, official, conventionally recognized marketing campaign. So it wasn't a bad business just right then. And so I think just for the novelty of it, uh, the folks at Sequoia listened to us. We ended up taking money from Don Valentine and Sequoia Capital, who's a very savvy player. And Len and I were not, and I think that's probably about the best way to, to put that. Don does just what he does. He has a formula, and he executes against it. And that doesn't make him a good or a bad guy, just what he is. The commitment we jointly made to each other is that we at Sequoia would do a number of things. We'd provide the financing, we would find and recruit management, and we would help create a management process, none of which existed in the company when we arrived. Sandy and I agreed to a forfeiture contract, a type of indentured servitude, where if we didn't do what the company asked, they would have the right to repurchase the shares that we actually already owned. We ended up with a four-year vesting agreement and 30% of the stock in the company and no employment contract. And I would strongly advise anybody watching this program not to do it that way. How should they do it? Well, certainly get your own lawyer. Sandy and Len soon discovered what many entrepreneurs before them have learned, that the company you founded is no longer the place you work. It was August 28th, 1990, but who's counting? Okay, and what, what happened that day? Well, quite simply, I got fired. We had discussed uh, this event in that sooner or later the venture capitalists always want to get rid of the founders. That's just part of Don's formula. Both were very critical and helpful people to launching Cisco, no question about it. Len is a very, very good technician and recognizes that he has little interest or little ability in management and positions himself accordingly. So in the company he was the chief technical officer. Sandy, who is a person very committed to a number of aspects of business is or was very acutely sensitive to how well the customers were treated. Don's opening words to me, you know, the first time I ever met that man, I wouldn't have known him from the man on the moon where I hear you're everything that's wrong with Cisco. Um, you know, I'm also the reason why there is a Cisco. What went wrong back at the ranch? Well, the end of the story is that one day, with the president, John Morgage's prior approval, seven vice presidents of Cisco Systems showed up in my office. We had a, a reasonably civil meeting in our conference room, the outcome of which was a very simple alternative. Either I relented and allowed the president to fire Sandy Lerner, or they, all seven, would quit. It was probably time for Len and I to go. Um, you know, and that Len and I do not have company personalities, and I think we, we were finding it difficult to work in a larger organization. I think the way that it happened was wrong. The most regrettable thing, I would think, from their point of view, is they lost perspective and urgently sold their shares in Cisco at a time when the valuation of the company was a mere $1 billion or so. Had they somehow or other suffered this outrage with a little more financial wisdom, they might have sold when the company's market value was $10 billion or $20 billion or maybe even now at $56 billion.
The pain of not having $18 billion must be slightly lessened by the pleasure of having $100 million to your name. What to do with all that money? Sandy Lerner's foundation acquired the manor house in the English village where Jane Austen wrote her novels. This came up for sale in 1992, and I for some very illogical reason bought it thinking that it would be just a wonderful place for the center for the study of early English women's writing. Today Sandy is also the proprietor of a successful nail polish empire, Urban Decay, which specializes in grunge colors called bruise, mildew, and acid rain. Whatever would Jane think? Pride and prejudice or sense and sensibility? Len Bozak now runs a Seattle technology company. His charitable donations fund the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Len is not kidding. He's serious about the universe. Very, very serious. It's one of the most important questions that a sentient being can ever formulate, and that is, are we alone? Either answer, if you could obtain it, is of tremendous import. But you surely do not expect little green men to come and present you with a message. On the other hand, if you don't listen, if you don't, in any organized way, ask the question of the universe, what if it has an answer waiting for you? Think of what you've missed. The billion dollars. Today, Cisco Systems is worth $60 billion. In the intervening years, Cisco and its competitors went from steady to spectacular to incredible rates of growth, much of it fueled by the next great internet invention, the World Wide Web. And look what became of Len and Sandy's living room. Funding for this program has been provided by the annual financial support of viewers like you and by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. This is PBS.